Good morning, everyone. How's everyone today? Good. It's good to see you. Uh, see you all. I'm smiling now, but I might not be smiling at the end of Sunday. The Rays are playing the Yankees for four straight games. So. No, anyway. It's just a game, right? But it's good to see you all today. We have another new guest. Bob Jimerson is with us right over here. I don't know how many of you know Bob, but Bob was in the church in the very, very, very beginning. And uh, once again, another parent of someone who I was the youth pastor to. This is freaking me out, you know, here. His son Mike was in uh, my, my youth group, and of course so was Dwight's daughter Robin, and Joan's daughter Christy, and Lu Lu uh, Louisa's son and daughter, Melissa and Jason, and there's a few others that occasionally come that uh, my, I was the youth pastor. So you, what they're doing is they're checking up to make sure that my kid, the way they are today, I want to know if I had to blame you for it. You know? <laughs> no, not at all. So anyway, it's good to have all of you here. Our second week here in the cafe, and um, you kind of mentioned to me that you kind of liked it in here. So uh, they're working on seeing if we can continue to meet uh, in here. There's a crocheting class next door, so if you get really bored today and want to go crochet, you can. <laughs> next door. And she's actually, they usually meet in here, but she was actually glad to meet in there because it's just a small group of ladies. They felt kind of odd being in this bigger, bigger room. So, um, but anyway, we'll see how long this, this lasts. But it's good to see you all today. Why don't we start with a word of prayer and we'll get into our new song here. Our Father and God, we thank you for another beautiful, beautiful day. It is the day you have made, so we will most certainly rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to study your word, and we do pray your blessing upon um, the, our time together. That Lord, as we look at this beautiful 91st Psalm, I pray that you speak to our hearts, that we might be receptive to the truth you have for us. You are our divine protector. And in a crazy world we live in right now, Father, we need the assurance to know that um, our God is with us. We don't doubt that for a second, Lord. But Father, I pray you'd reassure us this day. We continue to pray uh, for our nation, for those who are grieving in, uh, in Texas. Father, we can only imagine, and even our imagination um, cannot even touch the depth of their pain right now, Father. So we do pray that you would comfort them, that the church, uh, churches in that area, Father, or the church, will rise up to comfort, to encourage, uh, Lord, bring healing, and that, Lord, you'd show our nation that, uh, I'm not going to get political here, but it's, it's not a gun problem, uh, it is a mental health problem, but most importantly, Lord, it's a sin problem. Yeah. So, Lord, please, we need revival, we need yeah. your spirit, we need your grace. And Jesus, we also say, Lord, come quickly. But Father, in the meantime, we're not asking for an escape. Lord, we're asking, as this Psalm teaches us, uh, your divine protection. So be with us now, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I think it is rather providential that uh, Philip suggested that we look at the 91st Psalm. You know, here, <laughs> the, the last Psalm we looked at was the 139th Psalm, and we saw how beautiful it spoke about the Lord knitting us in his mother's womb, our mother's womb, and I thought, well, gee, isn't that interesting? That's right when Roe versus Wade was on the news. Yes. And now we're looking at the 91st Psalm, and Philip didn't think of, of, none of us knew that tragedy was going to occur, but you're going to see that this is a Psalm of, uh, of comfort. I wanna to begin today by reading to you a brief article that I found that was written in 2007 concerning this psalm. The first verse of Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Here's the article. Soldiers serving in combat zones want to wear clothing that protects them. Flak, flak jackets and uh, Kevlar helmets, certainly. But many of our soldiers are literally wrapping their heads with the biblical promises of God's protection. Texas resident Jill Boyce 
is affectionately known as the Bandana Lady. Since 2003, Boyce has been distributing camouflage bandanas with Psalm 91 printed on them to deploying service members. Soldiers facing danger have historically turned to Psalm 91 for comfort, drawing courage and reassurance in its words, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. And he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. The idea of the bandanas came to boy six months before the war began in Iraq and she believes it came straight from above. In a dream, I saw our troops cross over the border from Kuwait into Iraq. Many were being injured and killed as I watched. Startled awake, Boyce began to pray. Though she wasn't familiar with Psalm 91 or affiliated with the military in any way, Boyce says that the next day she envisioned a military bandana with Psalm 91 printed on it. I felt God was giving me the idea to get it done and out to the troops. Immediately, Boyce visited a local Army-Navy store, researched screen printing, and tracked down a chaplain stationed at Fort Hood, Texas. Using money from her income tax return, Boyce printed 79 bandanas and drove three hours to Fort Hood, where she, she distributed them to the troops scheduled to deploy the following day. The chaplain requested hundreds more. Testimonials from soldiers began to trickle in from overseas. Thank you for giving me something that wasn't bulky that I could keep with me to always keep God on my mind, wrote one sergeant. Boyce began to raise money to meet demand and eventually began to sell the bandanas at wholesale to chaplains and retail to individuals. It's been pretty hectic, says Boyce, of the past four years. Currently, she personally receives and fills up the 25 orders, and this is 2007, um, 25 orders a day and ships roughly 3,000 a month. Chaplain Matthew Prince, set to deploy with Marine Battalion 37 next month, says, I've taken my Psalm 91 bandana and put it in my Kevlar. It not only makes it more comfortable to wear, but reminds me that not only does the rifle, my mind, and fellow Marines protect me, but God protects me. And just how long will boys continue her bandana project until they all come home? My goal is to get a bandana into the hands of every man and woman in the service who wants one. Wow. Now, I don't know what she's doing today. I just was Googling and just reading different things and came across that. So I like the things she's still doing, but I thought that was pretty cool. Because as you're going to see, as we look at this 91st Psalm, it, it has many, many things to, to say to us, but one of the things has to do with divine protection. So why don't we just read the entire Psalm right now, 90, the 91st Psalm, and then we'll begin to, to look at it. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I'm reading the NIV version. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you in, to guard you in all your ways. They will lift up, they will lift up, mm -mm, they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. 
It's a beautiful, beautiful psalm. And as you're going to see, as we look at it, a skeptic would read that and say, well, that's not true. There's plenty of trouble in the world. Christians die in battle. Christians get in car accidents. Christians trip over something and fall. Um, Christians get bit by cobras. I don't even want to think about that. I hate snakes, you know. But these things happen to, to Christians, so this, this isn't correct. Now we know, as we'll see, and I don't want to start getting into to this at this particular moment, because I want to tell you the background of it before we look in verse 1, is that when the scripture says that these things won't happen, we know it's certainly implied from the rest of scripture, especially from the mouth of Jesus, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer of overcome the world. If the cobra bites you, can any good come out of a cobra biting you? Well, yeah, <laughs> I know not at the moment, you don't think not, but my point is, is that no matter what befalls the Christian, all things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. As we've said it probably 10 times in our study here, not all things are good, but God is able to turn all things to good. So as you're going to see, this is, it's just like the, the proverb, train up a child in a way he should go and when he's old he will not depart from it. That is not a promise. So you have to understand, most of the Proverbs are not necessarily promises. They're practical advice that if you raise your child up in the way they should go, I hate to use the word chances, but there's a very good possibility that when they're old, they won't depart you know, from it. So I hope you don't misunderstand that. That's not a promise, because if it's a promise, then certainly a parent is going to say, well, I did something wrong, it's my fault. I didn't train up my child perfectly in the way of the Lord because right now they're not walking, you know, with, with the Lord. Of course, you say not now. We don't know what the Lord has in store. But anyway, as you're going to see, this psalm brings us great comfort and great, you know, uh, just great comfort. This is considered, we talked at the very, very beginning about different types of psalms. Anyone want to take a stab at what type of psalm this is? It's considered two, under two different categories. I'm sorry? A psalm of protection, yes. It's a psalm of protection, but what, it, it falls under a category, you know, of that. Yes, it's a psalm of protection, and that's what I'm going to mention to you in a second. But it's going to, just like the 139th Psalm, it teaches us about the character of God, that he's our protector, so that makes it a wisdom psalm. So just for your general information, psalms that teach us, that teach us about the Lord specifically, they're usually considered wisdom psalms. And of course, it is on your piece of paper I handed out to you, you know. <laughs> But it's also considered a thanksgiving psalm because obviously the writer is giving thanks, you know, for his, for his, the Lord's, you know, protection, you know, for that. So we, uh, now no author is mentioned in the Hebrew text of the superscription, you know, to that, but there are some traditions. Jewish tradition ascribes it to Moses. Now, if you notice, if you look to the psalm, preceding this one, the 90th Psalm, what does it say as a superscription? A prayer of Moses. And what's the first line of that prayer of Moses? Lord, you are my, yeah, my dwelling place. And how does Psalm 90, 91 start? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest. So the tradition might say, but it's not put in your, your Bible as a superscription because it wasn't put as a superscription. But Jewish tradition, again, says that Moses wrote it and that uh, because the 90th, you know, before that, with David then compiling the Psalms and including it in there. The Septuagint, are you familiar with what the Septuagint is? Yes. The Septu... Uh-oh. Uh... -oh. uh did I spell that right? Close enough. 
the Septuagint. What's that? I don't think it's ENT. I'm pretty sure it's INT. Okay? Yeah, it's. One more time. The Septuagint, and this is important, this really is important for you know just for Bible knowledge. This is, and sometimes you see it listed as LXX. Sometimes you'll be reading a Bible study, or whatever, and I mention the LXX says, and you go, What in the world is that? Well, that's Roman numerals for 70. And the story is where well, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So it was literally used in the times of Jesus. So about 250 or so BC is that uh, it was commissioned by the ruler at that time. I think his name is Tom, Tom, Tonomy, not the Tonomy, but another, it doesn't matter. That he commissioned 70 Jewish uh, scholars, some say 72, to translate the Hebrew text of the Old Testament into Greek. So it was like the first translation. And there's miraculous stories that go with it that they weren't together and they translated, they came out word for word the same and things such as that. And to me, part of that is superstition, doesn't matter. But it's the text that Jesus would have been reading, well, he was speaking Aramaic, but the Greeks would be reading you know, this version of the Old Old Testament. Now, I tell you all that because the Septuagint attributes this Psalm to David, just historically to David. The Midrash, that's not a rash on your tummy, but the Midrash is a Jewish, um, basically a study Bible. It's taken the Old Testament, you know, text, their text, and uh, attaching a biblical commentary to it at the end of it. And how many own study Bibles? How many have a study Bible with you right now? Okay, right now. Okay, so a study Bible, they're beautiful. I have 10 different study Bibles. You know, so they have the text and underneath it, they have, this is what verse one is talking about. This is what verse two is talking about. Study Bibles are wonderful, but you got to be careful that you don't spend more time reading the study notes than you do the text, but it's still helpful. So the Midrash was a Jewish, in a sense, study Bible, and there it mentions that, again, Psalm 91 was composed by Moses, but they get more specific. They say it was composed by Moses on the day he completed the building of the tabernacle, not the temple, the tabernacle in the desert. So the verse describes Moses' own experience as he entered the tabernacle. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty. Other Jewish teachings say that Moses composed this psalm while ascending into the cloud hovering over Mount Sinai. Which, and, and he was reciting it, he was reciting these words as protection from the angels of destruction, from demons that would keep him from getting up there. There is, a, uh, as you're going to see, the Jews really connect this psalm to demon activity as protection from demons. Is that um, you're gonna see when we, I read it to you, but later on in verses five and six, when we get to terror, arrow, pestilence, destruction, some Jewish tradition is saying, those are demons. Each one of those are, you know, are, are demons or evil, evil spirits. So there's a, a great emphasis on the Jewish part to look at this as this Psalm is written for protection of, of demons. Now, this is why you also see, not the demon part of it, but this is why I read you that article at the beginning. This verse is often used uh, by the military. And I don't mean right now, I'm talking for 3000 years is that these verses have been clung to for you know divine protection while you know fighting the military now i don't know if this is practiced today but talk about more jewish tradition but from what i read psalm 91 is recited seven times during a burial ceremony 
As the casket bearers, the pall bearers, approach the grave, they stop every few feet, repeating the psalm. Now in the case of the burial of a woman, the casket bearers do not stop the procession, but they do repeat the psalm seven times. I think we could all come up with a funny joke if we thought about it long enough, why they stop seven times for the men and they just get to the grave with the women, I don't know. But they do say it seven times. But I say that to you because I, I hope you can see that there's some superstition found in old traditions. That's why, uh, I wasn't planning on saying this, but when you use the word, when you hear the word tradition, and I don't mean just fiddler on the roof, but some of you come from a background, a religious background, probably know where I'm going already, where tradition is important. What am I talking about? Yeah, the Roman Catholic Church, is that they would say that, yes, Roman Catholics, they would say, we, this is God's word, we love God's word. But, what? We also have the tradition of the church. So, all that means, sadly what that means, is yes, we have this, but the tradition of the church says that Pope so-and-so wrote about such and such and he suggested such and such and now it becomes you know dogma and so that's where you get beliefs about purgatory not mentioned in the scripture found in the apocrypha one one verse that's floating over here in maccabees you know about that well tradition says this is what the early you know this is what the early catholic church believed and the same thing with uh, the veneration of, of Mary and other saints and transubstantiation, it's based on tradition. This is why the Protestant Reformation, they, they love tradition in one sense, you know, but it was what? Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. If it's not here, then we ain't doing it, Amen. or we're not preaching it, or whatever. That doesn't mean we can't I pull out stories and use illustrations or whatever, but if I'm telling you a story that's contradicting this, and that's what the Mormons have done. The Mormons, they, they love the King James Version of the Bible, you know, but that's just one part of it. They have their Book of Mormon, which is not a doctrine book, it's a history book of the early America, of the uh, uh, Nephli that you know that lived here that lost tribe blah, 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 blah. I mean all this it's so there's a new doctrine in that but it's just a an imaginary story I won't go into that right now you know and the same thing with the Jehovah Witnesses is that they they love the King James version of the Bible but then they change it when it's appropriate you know for them but especially folks like the Mormons they add all these other strange beliefs that were all gods that we're all floating spirits. The reason, do you know why, uh, sidebar here, why Joseph Smith came up with the idea of uh, polygamy? Yeah. He was sick. Yes, <laughs> he was sick, <laughs> lustful, but there's a spiritual reason why. Dwight? Oh, I thought you were saying, I got an answer. It's because he said the Mormons believe that there's all these spirits floating around aimlessly in the universe. And this is kind of a Scientology belief too with Thetans, but we won't go there. But that the, all these spirits are floating around and the only way that spirit can eventually be a God, because they say our God was once a man like you and I, on his own planet with many, many others, eons and eons and eons ago he was raised up because of the mormon belief and now he's the god of his own universe and you and i will be gods of our own universe one day as well but that can only happen if that spirit gets to be in a human body so if i have a lot of wives and a lot of kids i'm bringing more spirits into the physical realm so they can be gods one day. And it's also a very quick way to populate your church. If you have five wives and you have 20 kids, five from each one of them, you got a pretty big nursery going on in your, you know, in your, your church, you know, there. 
So that's where, you know, and then of course it's interesting that this was ordained by God according to their text. They have, I am giving you a Mormon lesson I wasn't planning on, you know, but they got the Book of Mormon, then they have their other two important doctrine books, Pearl Great Price and Doctrines and Covenants. That's where the real doctrine is found. But that was supposedly given to Brigham Young and Joseph Smith by divine revelation. And if it's given to you by divine revelation, what's that mean? It's divine. It's God said it. It's scripture, right? Well, it's interesting in the 1800s when Utah wanted to become a state, wanted to be a part of the union to get tax benefits and government help and everything. Our U.S. government said no because you practice polygamy. Guess what happened? Wait a minute. The Lord has just told our prophets that we're no longer to practice polygamy. Absolute truth. So they don't practice polygamy. There's sex of these, when I say sex, I don't mean S-E-X, I mean S-E-C-T-S, groups of, of Mormons that still practice polygamy. You'll see TV shows, you know, about that. But they stopped that because of, uh, of wanting to be a part of the union. Same thing happened with, uh, with in the racial issues. They said in their documents, their doctrines, that blacks could never be part of the priesthood in the Mormon church. Well, in the 1960s, that didn't sit real well. You know, is that, what's the, what's the deal here? You're, you're practicing segregation, you're, you know, you're, raci you're racist, et cetera, et cetera. Guess what? Wait a minute. Another revelation. Another revelation. <laughs> Blacks can now be in the priesthood, you know, here. So it's interesting how God keeps changing his mind, you know, yeah, all right. these times. Okay, I'm sorry. Philip, one Mormon question and we'll move on. Yeah, the, uh, do you think this one common denominator for the whole thing is called us? Oh, yes. You know, finding all those theorems. Oh, yeah. Because I'm going to give you a good example. The uh, Arab, the Muslims, they believe that if we're gonna, we're gonna, when we die, we're going to get 10 women. Yeah. Each one. Uh huh. So those men don't mind to die because they know they're going to have a. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I'm, so I'm convinced. Yeah. Stuff. I'm, I'm convinced the whole Mormon polygamy thing had two reasons lust and build the church. Yeah. Yes. You know, that's what was going on there. Why am I telling you all of that? <laughs> All right, thank you. I don't often get affirmation from my bunny trail, so thank you. So, because she affirmed me, we'll be on many more bunny trails. No. But I remember why. Because I was talking about how some of the Jewish ideas about the 91st Psalm were really built on tradition and superstition. I mean, uh, uh, listen, I'm all for repeating the, the 23rd Psalm. Remember what I told you earlier about the uh, original movie, War of the Worlds? Remember that one, the original one from the 1950s or so? That there's a scene where, uh, you know, the, everyone's being zapped by the, you know, spaceships and a priest walks out and he's reciting the 23rd Psalm. And you're thinking, oh, wow, it's going to be God's word that stops us. And all of a sudden, <laughs> And he's, he's vaporized, you know. I don't know if that was a commentary, a political commentary, you know, at the time of, you know, religion doesn't help because look what happened to the priests here, you know. But I don't know what the, the, the intent of the director or the writer was of having a priest going out there thinking maybe the 23rd Psalm would bring peace or whatever. But we have to be careful of using scripture as a mantra and as a superstition you know, we, we recite and confess and read and meditate and say God's word, not because it's a superstition that if I don't say it, you know, step on a crack and break my mother's back, you know, that it's because it's, it's the truth and we need to rest on, on God's word. Okay, enough about superstitions. So, whew, wow. Verse one. <laughs> Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, I hate to say the obvious, but it's necessary. We live in an evil world. You know, I'm, uh, 
was, I don't watch the news much at all, but obviously I was tuned in to see what was going on. And I forget who it was, doesn't matter. But the Fox person was interviewing, I think the Lieutenant Governor, that's the second in charge, right? Obviously a very devout Christian. And, um, you know, he flat out said, and a number of other flat out said, and the governor flat out said that this is a problem with evil, yeah. is that people's hearts are, are evil. Yeah. You know, as I said in my prayer, and I'm not, I've never shot a gun before in my life, you know, but I, I believe in the Second Amendment, but I'm not here to have a discussion about that right now. I don't quite understand why automatic rifles, big things, you know, if you're going to hunt and, you know, do target practice, fine. I, but that's, I have, do have an issue with that. But it's, it's not a gun issue because I read this morning that some of the governor of Texas said that if it was a gun control issue, then tell that to Chicago and New York and California who have the most stringent gun um, control laws. And there's more people murdered in Chicago in one weekend that were murdered in a school. I'm not minimizing the horror of it. It's definitely also a mental health problem. And I think that's where it has to be addressed. It's a fatherless problem as well. It's not a racial problem. I heard him say that the last four mass murders have been an Asian, a Mexican, uh, a black man, and a white man. That's been the last last four. So obviously it's not a racial thing necessarily. Is that it's a mental health and deeper a sin problem. And that's I, I don't know how our country's gonna address that. You know, they're not unless there's just you know plain revival. But followers of Christ, as Christians, we are not to be removed from this earth or be sealed in a holy bubble. Is uh, I'm, I'm friends with Christian singer, I think I quoted him before, Jeff Moore. Some of you are a little, who are involved in Christian music, remember, I brought Jeff Moore here for concert a number of times, but he had this song called Go to the Moon. And in it, he's talking about how he was sitting in a diner and he heard four kids, high school kids sitting behind him talking about all the trouble in the world. And someone said, what would happen if, I, I'm, this is my paraphrase, if trouble came to our town, where would you go? He said, I'd go to the moon. You know, I'd get away from here. In other words, you know, get me away from, you know, from trouble. And there's a line in it, I'm not gonna get it just right, but Jeff Moore says, basically I'm paraphrasing, that we're afraid that the world's gonna rub off on us. I thought we were supposed to be rubbing off on them. You know, the Lord is not going to take us, you know, out of this world until he's ready to. In the meantime, what does he want us to do? Hide? No. He wants us to pray. Oh boy, there's an awful lot of people angry right now. No more prayers and thoughts. Prayers and thoughts are doing no good at all. You know, well, obviously those folks haven't been praying, you know, but, but still, that's neither here or there. Um, See, I shouldn't have said that. Now I forgot where I was, where I was going with that. Joyce, where was I? <laughs> What's that? Verse one. I know. Oh, but I'm saying that we don't live. That's it. Is that we, we can't live in a bubble. I mean, we need to be in our Christian environment. We need fellowship. We need Bible studies. We need to gather together for, for church. But you can't hide. You know, my uh, late mother-in-law was the secretary to the pastor of a little Nazarene church and her whole life for the longest number of years was so isolated. She went from her home, Christian home, with her husband and two kids to church and the only time she ventured into the world was every Friday to get her hair done. And you know, I mean, you know, go grocery shopping, but all her friends were friends from the church. She was not involved with her neighbor. She was not a mean person at all, but basically she told, you know, Becky and her brother Mark, stay away from next door because next door they play the banjo a lot and they have friends come over and they play their banjos and so they drink beer, stay away, you know, you know, from them. It's part of my 
mother-in-law's, late mother-in-law's own anxiety, but it was like, stay away, stay in this, you know, bubble. And it was a wonderful, rude awakening for her from when she retired, she got a job. They built a house right next to a high school, one of our rival high schools, and she got a little job working in the office of the Board of Education there, and she met some real humans that weren't Christians. You know what I'm saying? I mean, she realized that, gee, there's a world out here, and they're not all ready to suck the life out of me and kill me or anything you know, like that. And it gave her opportunities to share her faith you know, with peoples, because she wasn't peoples. She wasn't used to sharing her faith. You know why? She was never with any you know, unbelievers. So we can't live in this world. The Lord's told us we have to live in this hostile world system and do something about the trouble and pray for it and love people. Yesterday at Helping Hands, we always gather together in a circle uh, and, and just have an encouraging word and a, and a prayer time. And so Elizabeth asked me to take care of it. And I, you know, the only thing that came to my mind was because the tragedy just occurred. I said, I know a lot of us are, are probably thinking about that. And maybe the people who are pulling up here are thinking about it. And you know what? We're not going to change the world and stop all of that right now. But you know what we can do? We can love these people that drive through here. So don't just put a box in their trunk. Say, hello, how are you? We're glad you're here. And when they say, thank you, you say you are very, very welcome. And if you have an opportunity to love on someone, if, they, if you ask someone, how you doing? And they go, well, you know, we have this little routine. One of the gals, um, boy, I'm, I'm so bad at just rambling. Um, but the one gal, Stacy, is the one that calls the cars up and she counts them and she's so bubbling. She goes, hey, good morning, how are you? And if someone says, well, I'm going through chemo or something, I'm usually staying around, she goes, Randy! <laughs> and I come over and I go, what's up? And she says, well, uh, uh, Thelma has, has had her you know, chemo yesterday. She's not feeling well today. And so I call oh, Thelma, can we pray with you? Sure, you know, and so we just pray with her and I, I pray the gospel and I pray. Because <laughs> there's a line of cars waiting, you know, behind there, but you know, you just take that minute to encourage someone. So I said to the group, we, we may not change the, you know, everything going on there, but we might be able to change one heart. We're changing, the, we're changing their world that day. Yes, we're changing the world, that their world that day, and maybe it will change the world on a continuous, you know, basis. So we know, as I said at the beginning here, even though this psalm appears to promise us complete protection, we know that in this world we will have tribulation. We know we're gonna face trouble, but we do have the assurance that the Lord's with us. I mean, if I stopped right now and said, okay, testimony time, how many of you have examples of where the Lord you know, protected you? And then I think a lot of us would. Here's the funny thing, is we're gonna get the glory and I, I, I like to use this little illustration, especially someone who's really hyper on, you know, divine healing. And I'm all for, you know, praying for a prayer of health, you know, but for someone who's really caught up in it and all of a sudden at 50, they die of cancer and they stand before the Lord. Lord, I was your faithful servant all these years. I didn't just tithe, I double tithe. And I was always in church and I was always witnessing and I had faith to move mountains, etc. Why did I die of cancer? And the Lord's gonna say, child, let me show you now the 6,559,000,000 times I kept you from dying. From that car accident, from that virus that was in your body and I took it right out, you didn't even know it. You know, that cancer that started to develop there in your liver, I took it out, you didn't even know it. You didn't even ask for it. I took it out because of my good providence, my perfect plan, you weren't going to die then. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. And so I was with you, protecting you all that time. And you never once even thanked me because I did it all behind the scenes. You didn't even, you know, know it. So that's why we rest on this beautiful promise that the Lord is going to take care of us and protect us. So this verse, first verse is the theme of the entire psalm. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, those who draw close to the Lord God can find inner peace 
even in difficult situations. Turn with me, if you would, to Philippians. You know these verses, but I want you to see them anyway. Philippians chapter 4. General Electric Pepsi Cola. That's how you remember where it is. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, Philippians 4. Did, did you miss what I said there? General Electric Pepsi Cola. Or girls eat popcorn. That's how you remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And that the five T's are all together. Okay? First, second Thessalonians, first, second Timothy, and Titus. All right. Little pastor tricks. All right. Six and seven. This is no trick. Here's God's word. Do not be anxious about anything. What's, what's anxiety? I get it. We all get a little nervous. We all get anxious at times. But what basically is anxiety? Okay, that's another, that's a synonym for it. What is anxiety? Okay, it's another synonym for it. Not trusting. Not, it's, we're not in control. So, again, I used the example of the other week. If I asked one of you, whoever the most shy person is here, and said, come on up here and tell us your story, you might get a little anxious because you don't know what the future, I, I might stumble my words, I might say things wrong, they might laugh at me, you know, whatever. See, we start thinking about the future because we're out of control, we don't have control, you know, for that. So, what's he tell us here? He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what will happen? Seven. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what is meant by shelter of the Most High? Well, as we saw in our previous study in the 139th Psalm, the Lord God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. So aren't we always dwelling in the shelter of the Most High? If he's omnipresent, he's always with us. Aren't we always, this is a trick question. Is aren't we always dwelling in the shelter of the Most High? Well, of course, in one sense, we are because the Lord's always, you know, with us. But first off, let me address the Most High. Most High is a beautiful reference, and we see it in the next Psalm as well, of God being above. There's no other gods, but a false gods and everything else. That's how he's referring to, to most gods. But shelter, although he's always with us, we always need to draw close to him. You and I can be in the same room. You and I could sit at the same table and not be talking to each other. I mean, uh, in uh, some Middle East uh, countries and Arab countries, I don't know, I've never been there, but a good friend of Skip and mine, Kathleen's, Paul Wonderly is a missionary, and he goes to Arab countries quite a bit, and it is not uncommon that if you are in a little cafe and you walk outside with your cup of coffee and there's a table with four chairs and two of them are taken, that they would invite you to come sit at the table. We would never do that. But they would invite, Paul says all the time, I walk out and Arabs would say, hey, come here, sit here, talk to me. <laughs> Paul talks to him. And what do you think Paul eventually gets to talk about? About Jesus. But, you know, we can sit at a table with someone we know and not, or someone we don't know and not say two words and know nothing about it. So yes, God's always with us, with us but what does it mean again to draw close to, uh, to uh, how's the verse go? I'm, I'm here, I'm quoting it, I don't even have it in front of me. About dwelling in the shelter of the Most High. What does it mean here again, shelter? We're talking about shelter, even though the Lord's always with us, being in his shelter means that we belong to him that we're not distant. What's the verse that says at one time, is it Romans or Ephesians? I think it's in Ephesians, I should know that. That once you were away, but now you are close. Once you were strangers, and now we're friends, we're children of the Lord God. We are near the Lord God and can draw near to him, knowing first that we belong to him. 
We're not distant, but now close in relationship. But secondly, shelter refers to being in intimate fellowship, talking with him, listening to him, resting in him. So you and I as believers, and I'm talking to myself, Elaine. Yes, and that's exactly right, because most of the time we are in the flesh, and I don't mean that in a sinful way. I mean, we'll just, listen, I'll be the first to admit it. I'm not driving on my car, talking to Jesus the whole time, and singing worship songs the whole time. I'm a rock and roller. I got the blues playing, you know. I'm, a, you know, I'm not always in that secret place you know with the, with the lord although in the cars where i do more praying than any other place not because i'm driving route 19 you gotta pray you know i don't mean that i mean you know i try my best whenever i get a red light instead of saying oh man a red light i go thank you lord a chance to talk to you and pray with you every time i see an ambulance every time i see an ambulance go by i pray for whatever's going on every time i see a fire truck go by Every time I see a funeral procession, I pray comfort to the family. I pray they know Jesus. And if they didn't, Lord, I pray that that minister, priest, rabbi, whatever, somehow will miraculously share the gospel. And someone will be touched by it. <coughs> wow, Randy, you are so saintly. No, I'm not. But I try to use those opportunities to draw close to the Lord. And so, yes, being in the spirit is simply us acknowledging the Lord is here with me. And I need to draw close to him. I need to know that I'm related to him. I'm his child. And my Lord wants to hear from me right now. Even if it's just, good morning, Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. So I will rejoice and be glad that I pray that every single prayer I pray, especially public. And I know some of my friends are like, yeah, go ahead, say it, say it, say it. you know, but I, I say it not as a, a a habit, repetition, I say it because I, I really mean it. That this is the day the Lord has made, meaning he's sovereign God. So I'm gonna rejoice and be glad that no matter what comes my way, if my God is sovereign, if he's with me every step of the way, if he's ordained the foot, my footsteps, if every day as we read in the 139th Psalm is written for me in his, his book, then what could possibly happen to me? Oh, you mean no trouble's gonna come your way? No, terrible trouble might come my way. What could the devil do to me? Kill me. And guess what? And you know what? Even that, the Lord is control of that. Just ask Job. Okay, I'm rambling on it. So we talk here about shelter. It's about it's drawing close to him, resting in him. And resting, what's it mean to rest in the Lord? That's, that's, that's good, that's a good question. What does it mean to rest in the Lord? If you, if you tell someone that's a little anxious right now, going through a hard time, you say, hey, shh, 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 shh. Rest, rest in the Lord. What are, we, what are we saying to him? Depend on the Lord, give it all to him. What else? These are all right words. Trust in him, we're gonna to get to that in, in a moment. I have a special thing to tell you about that. It reminds me of my little dog, Sonny, loves to cuddle, loves to cuddle. So I'm laying on the bed, he jumps on the bed, and right up next to me, loves to cuddle with me. Any of you have had children, what's the sweetest picture in the world of you holding your child? When, when I pick up one of my grandchildren, now they're all getting bigger, but Gloria is still little, she's two years old. So when I pick up Gloria, you know, usually you pick her up and she's just sitting and you're just looking at you, smiling at you. But there's times when you pick her up and she just melts into you. What is she doing? Resting. She's resting in me. But what is it about, I don't want to tell you too much. I want you to tell me the answer. Yes. Is that she trusts me. So I can relax and put down my guard and close my eyes and not be vigilant because I'm in the arms of my father, my grandfather, her papa. 
so she can rest in my arms. And that's what the Lord is calling us to do, is resting in him. Just as a dog would do so with his master, a child would do so with his parent. All right, let's get to verse two. Two verses, do you believe that? I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. What is a refuge? A place of security. A refuge is a place of security. Are you familiar with the Old Testament concept of the cities of refuge? You read about it in Judges. Is that the, the Lord made provision that if anyone committed a murder, accidental murder, is they were allowed to flee to, I think there were six, I think there were six cities of refuge. You, you could flee to that city and the family of the murdered person cannot come get you. That doesn't mean you're free. It just means you're safe, you're secure until the trial. So no one can take vengeance, you know, on their own. But the bottom line is, is that it's a place of refuge. And we see this word used quite a bit. I just want to read to you maybe one. Psalm 62, verse 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. He's a safe place. It just dawned on me as I read that, that supposedly in a pastoral setting, and I'm talking now pastor, parishioner, in a counseling setting, is that you're supposed to be able to pour out your heart to that person. Why? Pastor or therapist, counselor, why are you able to pour out your heart to them? Because it's supposed to be a secure place. The first thing you would say, especially, I, you know, I, I was involved in counseling before I went into you know, the ministry at all. But especially if I was talking to a young person, a kid or a teenager, first thing I'd say to them, I want you to know that whatever, and I say that to anyone, but especially to a young person, anything you say to me stays right here unless you tell me you're gonna hurt someone or hurt yourself. But anything you tell me is gonna stay right here with me. It's my promise to you. It's my legal obligation. It's my d d dedication to the Lord is that it stay, it, this is a safe place. I'm not going to talk about you in Sunday service. Well, I got an illustration for you. I had one of the young ladies, I won't say her name, but she's blonde hair, 16 years old, and usually sits over here, you know, or her initials are, you know, whatever. Uh, no, is that a refuge is to be a safe place. And that's what the city of refuge is supposed to be. So here's though what I want to look at is the next point is what is a fortress? Refuge is a place of security. He's also our fortress. What's a fortress? Say it again. A protector. It's a protecting place, a place that you'll be protected from attack. That when it says the Lord is our strong tower, what is implied with that? Both refuge and fortress is that it's a place of security, but it's a place that he'll protect us as well. But the key to not just this verse and this psalm and our Christian faith is found in those last couple words that I want to look at this morning, and that is... My God in whom I trust. Amen. Now on your piece of paper, I gave you three fancy Latin words. And this is from the writings of St. Augustine. And this has been incredibly helpful to me in understanding saving faith and what trust really means. So I wanna teach you these three words real quick. Not so that you'd be smarty pants, but that I think it'll help you, and it'll help you understand people that, how many of you know people that say to you, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they don't go to church, or they're in a nominal denomination, their life doesn't really show it, but they say they're a Christian, 
And wh what can we say to that? Well, I don't think so. You know, <laughs> unless you know him really well and you get in a discussion about it. I think this will help you. He used three Latin words, three kinds of faith. The first one is notitia, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, if I spelt it correctly. Notitia, maybe we get the word, maybe, notes, but this is basically the facts. The facts about something. Now, do you believe that Abraham Lincoln was a real person? What can you tell me about Abraham Lincoln? Facts. What's that? President. President. 16th president. He was tall. He was tall. He's from Illinois. Self-educated. Had a beard. Okay. So you can tell me facts about him. Okay, it's important that you know facts. Let me ask you, what, tell me about your notitia faith of Jesus. What do you know about Jesus, the facts? Now hold on, hold on. If you went to your next door neighbor, you know they're not a churchgoer. And you said to them, who was, we'll put it past tense for their sake, who was Jesus? What would they tell you? And you say to them, just give me the facts. What do you know? What would they say? I didn't hear, I heard five things that didn't catch a single one of them. A great man. What else? What are some facts? Baby at Christmas. Prophet. Where was he born? Bethlehem. Mother and father's names. Mary and Joseph. Uh, how did he die? Crucifixion. Crucifixion. What's Easter all about? Resurrection. His resurrection. Now you don't have to believe those things, but you can tell me the facts. So having a notitia faith in Jesus, does that save you? No. You just know the facts. I can teach the facts to a three-year-old. I can teach the facts to a parrot, and the parrot could say back, Jesus is Savior. <laughs> Jesus died on a cross, okay? I sound like a thank you. I've been told many things, but never that. So, but here's my point. Saving faith has to start with Notitia. You need to know, Elaine, where are you going? I'm teasing her, she told me she had to go. <laughs> so you need to know the facts about Jesus but knowing that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and now you're a Christian was that important well, it's not essential but it's good that you know what you believe in right okay the second is a census this is not every 10 years they do a census no a census, the word ascent, means those facts have now ascended to a place of belief. Now, do you believe the facts you told me about Abraham Lincoln? Okay, so if I were to ask you, oh, give me the facts of Popeye. Give me some facts about Popeye. A sailor man. Eat spinach. What's that? Had a pipe. He was in love with uh, olive oil. Bluto was his arch enemy. He had really weird forearms. They were like monsters compared to the rest. Okay, so you know the facts about him, but do you believe them to be true? No. No. You don't have an ascensus faith in Popeye. You just have a notitia faith. You know the facts about a cartoon character, but you don't believe them to be true, okay? So if I asked you the facts of Abraham Lincoln or anyone else, you can tell me those facts and you believe them to be true. So that's an ascensus faith. Now, here's where it gets interesting. This is very important. I don't wanna say most, but I'll say most. A good number of Americans not only have a notitia faith in Jesus, they have an ascensus faith in Jesus. What do I mean by that? They believe 
the facts to be true. Now be careful, I'm warning you right now, this is a trick question. Having the sense is faith, does that save you? No. no, thank you very much. Because it tells us in the book of James that even the demons believe and tremble. Do you realize the demons know more facts about Jesus than you do? And they believe every one of those facts. They were eyewitnesses to all these things. That doesn't save them. Unfortunately, this is where most Americans, this is where I was for the first 19 years of my life. If you asked me when I was a freshman in college at the age of 18, who was Jesus as a good Presbyterian boy? I'd say son of God, Messiah, Savior, died on the cross. I'd even say he died for my sins because that's what I've been taught. The guy across the hall from me, cannot remember his name, was only in my freshman year, was the first born again Christian I ever met. I didn't know what that was. Born again wasn't a common term in North Jersey. Jimmy Carter started running for president just around that time. And he was, it said on Time Magazine, born again. What is that? You know, he was a Baptist. He was born again. My, the fellow across the hall was born again, you know, but all that meant to me was he was more religious. I was on the telephone, we, the dorm was a narrow cinder block, one from here to the building away long. And I'm the pay phone, we had a pay phone in the hallway. That's how you use the phone. You know what a pay phone? Oh, yeah, all you folks do. <laughs> I'm on the phone talking to someone back home. He is in the hallway with his roommate playing hockey. Playing hockey with a ball, whatever. And so it's racking, racking, racking. They're yelling and screaming. And I can't hear a thing on the phone. And I got so mad that I turned to him and said, I can't believe I said this. You know, will you please stop it? I can't talk on the phone. And you call yourself a Christian. I can't believe I said that. It was totally irrelevant. But I said that to him. And he looked at me, picked up his thing, walked into his room and shut the door. He was so convicted by that, even though it had nothing to do with him playing in the hallway. That was the only thing I knew. That, but that was the only Christian I knew, even though I claimed to be a Christian because I believed the facts to be true. Now, you know a lot about Greek mythology, but do you believe them to be true? You know a lot of facts about Abraham Lincoln, but does that save you? No. These two here are human faiths, meaning we are able on our own to know the facts about something and believe the facts to be true. You can teach a child, you can teach anyone, go through a history class, teach you all the references to a historical character and you be completely convinced that they are really a real person. That's wonderful, but they're human abilities. This is where I'm going. Saving faith is a divine gift. And that is, I hope you can, well, you got it on your piece of paper, but is fiducia. Now, any of you know banking terms? What's a fiduciary fund? It's in charge of basically your interest. Yeah, I have no idea what it means, you know. <laughs> but I always ask that because I'm always, What's that? Yeah, it's a trust fund or something like that. You can trust them or whatever. Well, fiducia means trust. <laughs> That's what I'm getting at. It means you trust. So here it is, folks. You know the facts about Jesus. You believe the facts to be true. But by divine revelation, by the gift of grace, you now trust those facts to be true. You trust that Jesus died on the cross for you. So at 19, the night before I went to that little Nazarene church and came to faith, oh, I told you the story how Becky wrote me a letter, right? Okay, I won't bore you with that. But she invited me to church because Jesus is the most important person in her life. I never really heard anyone say it quite like that. I said, well, Jesus is cool. 
but Jesus needs to be the most important person in your life too. I go, okay. So you want to come to church with me? Sure. I go to church every Sunday. I go to your church. And sitting in that church, my eyes were opened. And it, I couldn't tell you what the sermon was. It was the whole experience. There was an altar call, but I didn't respond to the altar call. I didn't feel a, a need to because I sat, I, I didn't understand all that anyway, you know. But all I knew is that, as John Wesley said, my heart grew strangely warm. And I knew in my heart that my sins were forgiven. I understood for the first time, not because I was so smart, see, none of us can boast, but all because of God's grace that he opened my eyes. He spoke life into me. All those 19 years prior, he was working with me, preparing me for that day. But the day finally came when he said, you're mine. And he spoke life into me. So that's what trust is. So there's where your peace is. We'll close with this. And oh my goodness, I'm six minutes over. No wonder Elaine got up. She told me I'm getting up right at, I said, oh, we'll be done at 1030, don't worry. Ah, oh, my bad. I will say to the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That we cling to, we depend on. He's a God that we can count on. So let's close in a word of prayer. Come on in, guys. Come on in. I was watching you. That's okay. You're in just as I'm closing in prayer. Obviously in God's providence. How many of you guys had that barbecue last night? Thank you for the barbecue. And Pastor Dan, the wonderful men's leader. Father, thank you for meeting with us here today. Thank you, Father, for your saving grace that, Lord, you placed into us the ability to love you because you entered into us, Father. That, Lord, you allowed us to believe. You caused us to believe. You caused us to have a saving faith. Many of us, Father, maybe were brought up in the church. We knew all about Jesus. Would either be true? But one day, you opened our eyes. And we thank you for that life you gave us. So I pray, especially during these troubling days, that, Lord, we understand what it means to trust you in the dark time. That, Lord, we can be of encouragement to our neighbors, to our friends, to unbelievers around us. That, Lord, when they say to us, where's God? You, we can say to them, hey, God's never left the scene. But man is evil and needs Jesus. And so let me tell you about Jesus. And that, Father, we can be at peace. A peace that passes all understanding. So dis dismiss us now in your grace and love that will continue to reflect your glory to all we come in contact with. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you, folks. Sorry I kept you a few minutes. So it's rabbit trails.